Hi, this is Gary Glaub in Mooresville, North Carolina. We're up to lesson 21 in the book of Job, and today we're, we're covering only one chapter, uh, chapter 38, and in this one, God speaks. All right, we finally reached the most important part of the book of Job. All right, after listening to a lot of bluster, it's time for God to speak. All right, each of the five men have given us their own perspective over the course of this. So, you know, we, we heard from Job and then his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and then finally this young man steps in, Elihu, and speaks lots of truth. And, and Elihu was basically the warm-up act, right, for God. Now it's time for God to speak, all right? All three of Job's friends misapplied all of their knowledge of God to Job's situation. Job was in this situation where he was depressed and then defending himself against his friends, he became self-righteous in the process, right? Um, before proceeding, I probably should just let you know that we're going to slow down a bit, right? We've covered, you know, it, one chapter or one, excuse me, one lesson, we covered six chapters of Job's belly aching. And it's like I hurried through that. There just wasn't that much worth hearing. But now when we get to where God speaks, there's a whole lot worth hearing. And it's, I'm going to slow it down a bit and just whatever pace you know, ne needed to get through it is what's going to happen. All right. Before reading any verses, all right, I want you just to think about this situation for a moment. How many times have you actually heard God's voice? All right. And how do you think you would react if you'd question God and then God came and talked to you? right? And here he does it for four chapters. It's like we can just imagine Job quaking in his sandals, not his boots because he didn't have boots yet, but in his sandals. All right. I just can't even imagine what it must be like to be in his shoes right now. All right. I also wonder if Job's friends, when that storm was coming in, didn't just scram. You know, I think that they're not there. I have a feeling, just the way I see it, is this conversation is between Job and God. That's it. Everybody else just got out of there. All right? Made me want to you know, try to reflect on different times when God spoke. All right? Once was when he was giving the Ten Commandments. And we know that Moses heard God often. So God spoke to, to Moses often, but there was that time on... You know, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, whichever name you want to go by, uh, when God was giving the Ten Commandments, we could see this situation where all the people heard him. So let me read that. Exodus 20, verses 18 through 21. And as usual, reading from the New American Standard Bible, it says this. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. All right. All the people here heard God, right? And hearing God made them fear him even more, right? Thunder, lightning, a trumpet, and the mountain smoking certainly added to that fear, right? Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's easy for us to overlook the power of God, right? To ignore it to the best of our abilities. We go through life trying to make our own decisions, doing what we want to do, and even as believers, there's plenty of times when we just kind of ignore what God is capable of, right? Hoping that he won't do what he could do, right? In response to our sin. You know, we, we kind of ignore the power of God, right? We can put on a facade and fool everyone around us of who we are, right? And how good of a person we are. We can't fool God. God sees everything, right? God knows everything. There's nothing, nothing we can do to hide anything from him, all right? There are many times in the Bible when God speaks to people, right? And 
how do you perceive his voice, right? Do you, when you hear these, when, when we get to Job 38 and hear this, I want you to just make a note of it. Are you hearing it like God is in anger? All right, because I really don't see that. Anger is a response, right, typically. Let's say that I'm having a discussion with someone and it escalates based on something that I say or do to that other person, and it escalates where all of a sudden they get angry. Anger is a response to something I've said or done, right? And it's it happens because what I've said or done is unexpected. But with God, nothing's unexpected, right? God placed Job in this situation. He allowed Satan access to Job, and Job's response was exactly what God knew Job's response would be. So God really does have no, he has no reason to pour out his anger on Job when it would be a response to what Job has done. You know, God knew this exactly. Is God tickled to death with what Job has done? No. No, you know, Job was the most righteous man on the earth, but part of it here is to show Job that, hey, you know, you're not where you thought you were, right? But it also is to show us, hey, you're not where you think you are. You know, we all think that as Christians that we, we're trying to get better, we're trying to walk away from sin, we're trying to honor God more with our lives, but we're still just sinners saved by grace, right? We're, we're just a moment away from another sin, and sin separates us from God. So it's just one of these things that, you know, we just have to not be so high on our horse to believe that it's about us. It's about our behavior and what we've done. Instead, it's about God and who he is and what he's done, right? These words from God are going to draw Job closer to God. And in the same time, they should be drawing us closer to God. Certainly, Job is filled with fear, just like the children of Israel were on Mount Sinai, right? But instead, I picture this event being more like God speaking to Elijah, right? When Elijah basically had, you know, killed the false prophets, and then he ran away from Jezebel, and he ran hundreds and hundreds of miles, and he was exhausted. We could see that in 1 Kings Chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? It's like, I quoted here from the New King James Version instead of the uh, NASB, just because I like the translation better. It talks about the still small voice, right? Whereas in the NASB it says, a sound of a gentle blowing. That just isn't the same to me. But I love this passage because in the Old Testament, it strongly reveals the Trinity. All right, we could see that Elijah is standing on the mountain with the Lord. Well, who's that? It, it's Jesus. And then it says, the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, right? Right. So then we see that, oh, I forgot before that, the Lord passed by. And who's that? That's God the Father. But the still small voice, that's the Holy Spirit, right? Here, here we see three aspects of God in the Trinity right here in this passage. But I also like what, what God says here. And I think, I think it's uh, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking. What are you doing here, Elijah? The still, small voice. That's what it said. It didn't say, Elijah, you're such an idiot. What? How can you fail miserably like this with all I've done for you? What are you doing here, Elijah? It's a reminder. It's a prodding. It's this, this sense of, you know what? I've done everything for you. I will continue to do everything for you. But you gotta, you, you got to handle this differently next time, right? That's exactly how God approaches us with our sin. 
currently we're starting chapter 38. And I'm going to go through this in shorter sections of verses, just because there's so much in each one that I want to spend a little bit more time than normal. All right? So Job 38, verses 1 through 7, reading from the New American Standard Bible, and it says this, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who set its measurements, since you know, or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? It's interesting to me that God is speaking to Job out of a whirlwind. At the beginning of the book of Job, we saw that Satan used a great wind to kill Job's ten children, but here we, at the culmination of the event, now we see God using weather, and he's speaking to Job out of the whirlwind. All right, it's also interesting that where he starts is almost a restatement of something Elihu said in chapter 35. Uh, Job 35, 16, Elihu said this, Therefore Job opens his mouth in vain. He multiplies words without knowledge. This lets us know Two things. Number one, that God is in agreement with Elihu, right? And as discussed earlier in the in the lesson last week or the week before, words without knowledge are empty words, right? Prevalent in our society today. People speaking like they know so much and they have big flowery words and statements, but their words actually don't mean a thing. Job is the same man that God bragged about at the beginning of Job, the most righteous man on the earth. And now God is making this direct reference to Job's words without knowledge. Job has, has really sunk into that self-righteousness where he was a man of wisdom, and now his words are just full of just nothing, right? They're empty. Job's walk with the Lord, though, understand that even though at one time he had been the most righteous man, he isn't probably at this very moment, but his relationship with the Lord will be strengthened by this ordeal. What he's going through is the next time he will trust in God more, right? And that's kind of God's purpose with all of us. It's not a steady line that we're walking. Instead, it's ups and downs. It's, you know, walk... Walk to a mountaintop, go back to a valley floor. God has this design for each of us to teach us, to have us draw closer to him. I can't imagine what it would have been like to be Job, right? Think about that God created all that we can see and all that we cannot see with his breath. And here God's breath is laying into Job. It's like, oh my goodness, all right? My bones would have been shaking so much that it would have sounded like a symphony. All right, Job asked for a time to speak to God, or he actually demanded a time to speak to God. But as we see here, God does all the speaking. He's already heard all of Job's words. And by, by his statements, right, we can tell that he was privy to, listening to that entire conversation by repeating exactly what Elihu had said. All right, what does God mean when he tells Job to gird up his loins like a man? That's an interesting comment as well. All right, in those days, remember what they wore, right? They had these long flowing robes and they would, if they had action, if they had something they needed to do, they would pull those robes up and like tuck them into their garter, tuck them into what we would say is a belt, right? So they can actually have action. And it's like, I think that God's telling Job, get prepared for action here, my friend. All right. But it also reminds me of Isaiah 45, 1, with Isaiah's prophecy stating that Cyrus would loose the loins of kings. All right. And then in Daniel 5, we see King Belshazzar having that reaction. You remember that that passage that discusses the handwriting on the wall. And the handwriting was actually a biblical prophecy telling Belshazzar what was going to happen. Daniel 5, 6 in the New American Standard Bible says this, Then the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. All right, I picture his fear 
including a weakening of his bowels. And I also think God is telling Job to man up and not lose similar control. I, I, I don't think it's, it would be a surprising thing to do, you know, to be that fearful. You, we know what happens. But to man up also draws this correlation for Job that, hey, buddy, let's put this on solid ground, right? You've been standing up to me like you're on my level, like you're the same as I am. You're wanting to question me like I'm a fellow man. I'm not a fellow man. I'm God, right? And you are not on my level. So Job can't God up. The best he can do is man up, all right? God says, you will answer me. The New American Standard Bible says, you will instruct me. I think that's a pretty poor interpretation. You will answer me. Is that God is not giving Job a choice. I'm going to ask you some questions. I don't care if you want to answer or not. You're going to answer me. You know, you've, you've stood up all full of yourself, demanding my answers, demanding that I speak to you. It's like, be careful what you ask for, because you might just get it. That's what Job's receiving right now. All right, we go to verse four. and Notice that God begins at his own beginning, at creation. And when I say his own beginning, it doesn't mean that God has a beginning. It means that God's actions began with creation, right? He existed before creation, right? Creation is God. It is God. It reveals much to us about God. The world, even after the onset of sin, the sin curse, is beautiful, huge, diverse, majestic in its splendor. That creation culminated with God creating us. And as a reminder, he didn't create us because he was lonely. He created us because he wanted to share his love with us. That's number one on God's list. Where were you when I created this world from nothing for you? Were you there when I planned your life so you could know my love? That's kind of what God's saying to Job. Imagine God stating those same words to all of us, the science, of God, the science above God people, right? He's speaking to them too, people that want to ignore God's act, action of creation, God's love, you know, all about God, and they want to make it all about science, all right? People are so prevalent today. Stephen Hawking said this, God is the name people give to the reason we are here. But I think that reason is the laws of physics rather than someone with whom one can have a personal relationship, an impersonal God. Hawking doesn't have a clue. So once again, here's a man that everyone thought of as so bright, trapped in his own body, trapped in his own mind, and goes back to Romans, think, professing to be wise, they became fools. Imagine God asking Stephen Hawking the same question that he asked Job here. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Right? Hey, Stephen, you weren't there when all this happened. Everything that you say is just a guess. That's it. God saying, I was there. I know exactly what happened. I planned it. I did it. I know the results of it. In fact, I know every single ramification or consequence that comes from that creation. You don't have a clue. All right. In this analogy, starting in verses four through five, God uses construction terms. And I don't think it's ironic that Jesus came to earth as a carpenter. Jesus is the foundation of our faith. He is the chief cornerstone. All right, God continues. Verse 5, on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? All right, who are the sons of God? And I think that Genesis made this kind of apparent when you read through it, the difference between the sons of man and the sons of God. The sons of God are angels. The sons of man are us, even though as believers, we are children of God, right? We are direct in line. We are children of God, and I think that's very important. We should all be in that same place as Christians, where the sons of God shouted for joy. And it reminds me of rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. 
He is our joy. It shouldn't change our joy. It shouldn't change based on day-to-day -day successes and failures. Instead, we should continue to rejoice in the eternal hope of Jesus Christ. Okay? God is asking Job many questions here, and I don't want you to picture those questions to resemble a whiny Jerry Seinfeld stand-up comedy routine. Who made the... <laughs> Who made the stars? You know, it, it, it's just, that's not how God is speaking to Job here, right? Instead, God is speaking of the, of the acts that he personally accomplished during creation. He thought of everything. All right, let's go on to verses 8 through 11. Once again, reading from the New American Standard Bible. Or who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt and doors. And I said, thus far you shall come, but no further, no farther. And here shall your proud waves stop. God used figurative language depicting a mother giving birth to a baby with the terms womb and swaddling band in verse nine. In that we get a true picture of how God looks at his creation. It's his baby, right? It will grow change, struggle, all with the support of his loving hands. Verse 11 then speaks of the limits that God imposes even on oceans. I remember reading a book by a man named Bill Koenig. Bill Koenig was in the White House press corps under President Bush, uh, the second President Bush, and strong Christian. He wrote this book called Eye of the Storm, and in the book he detailed how Within 10 days of a significant weather event, if you looked back, you typically could see the United States doing something like anti-Israel, all right? And he based it on the verse in Genesis that said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Um, and one of those, one of those specific events was Hurricane Katrina. And he talked about Ten days before Katrina hit, the U.S. forced Israeli settlers to evacuate the Gaza Strip. And I can still picture the news reports, right? These people scratching and clawing to retain their homes. And if you don't think that God is in charge of weather and waves and tsunamis, you haven't read your Bible. He speaks through weather often in the Bible. And we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All right, so here he is speaking out of a whirlwind, right? So let's move on to verses 12 through 15, New American Standard Bible, and it says this, Have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the ends of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and they stand forth like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld, and the uplifted arm is broken. The description in verse 14 is really interesting. What I picture is the raised edges from embossing, right? This is exactly what the earth looks like, isn't it? It's not a flat surface. It has the seal of God on it. God describes it to be like a garment. The earth is clothed in God's magnificent array. The flowers, the grass, the trees are eye-catching clothing, right? Let's move on to verses 16 through 18. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. So where does water come from? Well, it's all a cycle from the rains of the heavens, the, the flows of the rivers and the ocean. No, we also see that God says here the sea has springs. How do we know that? Well, he told Job. Next, God discusses death. Do you know when you're going to die? God does. He's numbered the days on each of us, right? He knows exactly the moment, exactly the moment when each of us is going to die. And it's easy for God to do that because he's outside of time. All right, I remember a story from September 11th where there was one man who worked at the Pentagon and he called in sick that day. And he got on an airplane going, going to New York, right? He was on a trip. 
I don't know where directly he was going from, but interestingly, he was on both death lists, right? He was on the death list at the Pentagon because the, the plane that crashed there hit his office and he was on the death list of one of the airplanes. And it doesn't really matter what that man decided that day, his time was up, right? No matter what, no matter what, he couldn't have gotten out of that in any way. When God has that day set, it's going to happen regardless to us, all right? God, God is putting Job in his place in verse 18. Have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this, all right? And God's not really asking Job, hey, you know, do you know all this already, all right? You don't know this. You don't have a clue, right? You don't have a clue. You're a man that I created. You're not God who created it all. He's putting him in his, in his place in a very soft way. This is the same Job who's standing tall, you know, as high as he can on his legs, yelling up at God. It's like, you're going to answer to me, right? He's demanding action from God. He's demanding God to listen to him as if he's on the same level as God or even above him. This certainly changes Job's perspective and should change ours when we fall into those, our own pits of self-righteousness, all right? Let's go on to verses 19 through 24. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And darkness, where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the day of war and battle? Where is the way that the light is divided or the east wind scattered on the earth? All right, verses 19 and 20 take us back to the Genesis account of creation. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. On the fourth day, he created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Yet even before the earth received the light from those places, it had light. Light doesn't come from the sun. Light comes from God. As stated before, in heaven, there will be no shadows, right? As his light will shine on everything from everywhere, right? In verse 21, God is pointing out to Job that he wasn't alive when this happened. It seems to be that God's using a bit of sarcasm here, right? You know, as you were born then, not. But even if Job had been born, it would have been because God created Job not the other way around, right? Today, there have been, there's many atheists than ever before, right? And those atheists make fun of believers for their fantasy, for their stupidity. And it's, it's almost as if they think that we're trying to create God by our belief. But belief doesn't create, does it? God is, regardless of, if no one believed in God, God is. He still is, right? And I've used the analogy before is that belief can't change something. If, if I believe with all my heart that the sky is blue, right, but it's really raining, I can walk outside and no matter how strong my belief is, I'm going to get soaked, right? Belief has nothing to do with reality, with existence, all right? God is regardless of us and regardless of our belief. No one was born when God created light. The only ones that were there, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, the only ones there. And God's asking Job, were you there? Were you there? Are you God? I created you. Then we get to verse 22, which is one of my favorites in the chapter. I remember reading Job on the first time I read through the entire Bible, and I got to this this verse. And it's like, it's so interesting. Once you know that Job is possibly the first book of the Bible completed. So in that first book completed, God is already speaking about this event. All right. The hailstones that are time, that they're stored up in, in heaven's storehouses for the time of trouble. All right. This is pointing forward to the seventh bold judgment of Revelation when 80 to 120 pound pieces of hail are falling on people, right? Of all the judgments in Revelation, I don't know why it is, but that one just scares me. Like, 
120 pound pieces of hail falling out of the sky. Thinking about the speed of the speed of that, right? 32 feet per second per second dropping onto a man's head. You know, they've they've made these statements that if you drop a penny from the Empire State Building and it lands on a person, it would go through them, it would kill them. Think about what happens with a 120 pound hailstone. I can't even begin to imagine the terror in that event, all right? So let's look forward to that verse in Revelation that talks about this event of the future. And huge hailstones, about 100 pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. Revelation 16, 21, all right? That's an event that's still gonna happen, but even at creation, God had stored up the hailstones in heaven for this event, for this, it's, it's called the time, the time of distress in the New American Standard Bible, but in most versions of the Bible, you see it talked about as the time of trouble. And in the Old Testament specifically, we see the phrase often of the time of Jacob's trouble. And it refers to a time when the time of the Gentiles has passed. And it's once again the time of the Jews, right? When God's trying to pull the Jews to salvation through Jesus Christ. The Antichrist is here and dwelled by Satan. He's taking out hatred on God's chosen people. Two thirds of the Jews alive in that time will perish, will die. But one third will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, all right? And it's a seven year period and then you have it, basically the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years of that period when probably most of these judgments are occurring. In the judgments of Revelation, God will be taking out his wrath on a sinful earth. But in that wrath, as always, because it's part of God's nature, he will continue to have grace and mercy. To us, it's a bit mind-boggling that in this discussion with Job, God is discussing an event that wouldn't be happening for thousands and thousands of years, all right? He's already prepared for it. He was prepared for it before creation. God, who is outside of time, is pointing Job to how little he knows, right? All right, verse 24 speaks of an east wind. Remember now, an east wind is one that originates from the east, not one that blows toward the east. The sun rises in the east, it sets in the west, and Matthew makes a statement that certainly makes it sound like when Jesus returns again, he's going to come from the east. Matthew 24, 27 says this, For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. I also think it's interesting that the word in Greek for wind is pneuma, and that's the same word in Greek for the Holy Spirit, right? Right? And it gives us some similarities, maybe, for our limited minds between the Holy Spirit and wind. All right, let's move on to verses 25 through 30. Who has cleft a channel for the flood, or a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land without people, on a desert without a man in it? to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the seeds of grass to sprout? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven? Who has given it birth? Water becomes hard like stone and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. These are sweet verses, right? They speak of God's mercy and his provision. Even though the dry land, dry land might not ever see a man, right? There might be places that are so desolate that a man never walks on them. God still is taking care of those aspects of his creation, right? God provides. This should remind us that his creation is not just about us, but God loves us more than anything. He mercifully gives the dry land rain, that it may grow tender grass, why do we question the provision that God gives in our lives, right? When he'll even do this to the, to the dry land, why do we question what God supplies and provides for us? He feeds the birds of the air, as Jesus reminded us, 
and he'll provide for us too. Now we get to one of my favorites, verses 31 through 33. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? Job mentioned these same three constellations earlier in his diatribe, a couple times actually. God's bringing up the three constellations. So once again, that's reminding Job, hey buddy, I was listening the whole time that you were mouthing off against me, <laughs> right? I heard everything you said. Job wanted a private audience with God. I bet now he's very sorry that he asked for one. Knowing God has heard everything, he knows he doesn't need to restate anything. Doesn't need to state his case again. God was listening the first time. Additionally, God puts him in his place quickly. And Job doesn't want to question God anymore. The other important aspect of this verse, though, is something I mentioned earlier. Pleiades and Orion are two constellations that have gravitationally attracted stars, all right? So basically what that means is these stars attract each other when everywhere else in the universe, stars repel each other. So it's like taking a magnet and putting a North Pole against a North Pole. They push away from each other. That's what happens in the universe with stars. But in this section, Pleiades and Orion, those stars attract each other, which is very interesting. And here in this, you know, early, early, early book of the Bible, right, it's talking about God has, has bound the chains of the Pleiades and Orion. He's He's bound them together. It's just such an easy, easy thing to see that for all these science over God people, here God even early on is showing his understanding of science that's far beyond what scientists is, right? In the first, in the first book of the Bible, complete it. Verse 32 is also interesting, all right? In the New American Standard Bible, it says, Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with her satellites? All right? In the New King James Version and most other versions of the Bible, instead of saying constellation, it says, can you lead forth Matseroth in its season, All right? So they probably, NASB probably removed that because they don't think anybody knows what Matseroth is, but it's easy to figure it out. Um, Matseroth was basically the precursor to the modern day Zodiac, right? So think about in that agrarian economy, you'd have these people out with their children looking up at the stars of the night instead of filling their minds and brains and time with television, right? They were telling telling the story through the stars of what happened. And if you think about like Leo, you know, Leo the lion, and it pointed to the lion of the tribe of Judah, to Jesus. And then you see Virgo, it's the virgin birth. So all this, this, this is how the people back then used the stars to tell the story of God. And just as Satan does on everything else, he corrupted that as well into what's, you know, the modern day Zodiac, right? Where people are basically fortune telling through it, right? But I think it's really interesting to see this depicted in the book of Job, all right? And this verse culminates with in season, right? Of, you know, can you lead forth Matzeroth in its season? Or even if you thought of it as a constellation in its season, is that this also points to science, right? God knowing everything about science is that, you know, certain constellations weren't visible all year, were they? Or they were visible in a different place because of the fact that, you know, we had the earth moving around the sun, right? And you know, people back then might not have understood that the earth was moving around the sun, but God certainly did, right? The constellations weren't always there and visible, but they returned in their season, right? All right, so let's go on. We'll finish Job, and we're going to, we're not finishing it. We have four more verses, all right? Uh, Job 38, 34 through 38 says this, can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that an abundance of water will cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? 
who has put who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clods stick together all right job can't do any of this Elijah could do some of it though couldn't he 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 sealed up the the heavens so that it didn't rain right he, he, he created a famine. And then we also see a time coming forth in the book of Revelation when there's two witnesses. And one of, one of the gifts they have is they seal up the heavens to famine for three and a half years. Right? So it makes many Bible scholars believe that one of the two witnesses is Elijah who had that gift of sealing up the heavens. God is the only one who can put wisdom in the innermost being. We know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Job wasn't so fearful of the Lord in his earlier complaints. But certainly God has brought him back to that place where Job is fearful with his knees knocking together, right? Playing that bone symphony, all right? The end of this passage reminds us that only God can end a drought. And that drought can be a spiritual one just as easily as it can be a physical one. Notice what is happening here is that God is ending a spiritual drought in Job's life, right? And now it's time to finally finish chapter 38, verses 39 through 41. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lair? Who, pre who prepares for the raven its nourishment when its young cry to God and wander about without food. God is feeding Job right now with these words, right? And he's feeding us as well, if we're paying attention. Isn't it ludicrous for us to question God, right? If you think about it, we get so high and mighty, thinking we know so much, thinking we're so intelligent, so bright, and it doesn't really matter how smart you are, your knowledge just is nothing compared to the knowledge of God. It doesn't matter how wise you are. It's nothing in comparison to God. We speak from incredibly limited experience, right? God's experience involves all that has ever occurred. He did it all. He knows it all. He created it all, right? His love is paramount. Another amazing aspect is that God doesn't go on the offensive when Job threatens him and questions him and calls him, you know, make, makes all these accusations against God. He could fry him to a, a crispy crunch like a giant Cheeto with that bugs, giant bug zappers, like, you're gone, Job, based on Job offending God, questioning God. But God still has patience, right? I don't think... God's encouraging us to question him, right? To accuse him, right? But it, it still is encouraging that he still loves us. And it's because God's love is based on who he is and what he has done, not on who we are and what we have done, right? It's not based on that. Love is his very nature. It's based on him. All right, we only got through one chapter today, but because God is speaking it's plenty, right? We had a lot, a lot to cover. And all of the Bible, these are some of my favorite chapters. All right, next week, we're going to hear more from God. In the meantime, I hope that you hear from him often this week. God bless you from Morrisville, North Carolina. This is Gary Glaub. Above all powers, above all kings, of all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all Above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure.
measure what you're worth. Crucified and laid behind the stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all crucified laid behind the stone you live to die Rejected and alone, like a rose, trampled on the ground. You took the fall, and you thought of me.